No tears in heaven. But that means on earth, there are tears of mourning, tears of pain, tears of brokenheartedness, tears of shattered dreams, and tears for death. Often, these days on earth, though we are the light of the world, are hours of darkness for God's people. One of the darkest hours for the people of God ever recorded in the scripture was their exile in Babylon. It was during this time that Psalm 137 was written, in which we sense the heart of those fellow brothers and sisters of faith. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, May my right hand forget all its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. This was one of the darkest hours in the history of God's people. And you know, at this hour in the 21st century, so many of God's people remain in Babylon. In the churches, there's no more singing. There's no more joy. Gone are the dreams. Shattered are the hopes of people who were baptized into idealism that the world was going to be evangelized and their lives would be forever changed. During that time of exile, God gave the people a prophet. His name was Daniel. Let's turn over there. The book of Daniel is a striking book that shows the sovereignty of God and shows how God sustains his people even in the darkest hours. We read right here in verse 1 of chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, King of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles for the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them in the treasure house of his God. Well, we know right here that the date of the third year of King Jehoiakim is 606 B.C., We can be sure about that. Interestingly enough, we read then in verse 3 that during this first exile from Judah, the Bible says, Then the king ordered Aspenaz, king of his court officials, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Now, if you go on down to verse 7, you find that numbered among those, quote, royal family and nobility, is Daniel himself. Daniel was from the royal house of Judah. He was in the lineage of King David himself. And if we use the more accurate translation of the Hebrew right here, in verse 3, it says that the king ordered Aspenus, chief of his court officials, actually it's chief of his eunuchs, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family, the nobility. The nobility, in many cases when they were exiled, whether it be the Jews or other country, they were castrated. They were made eunuchs. And so was Daniel. And this fulfilled the prophecy of God in Isaiah chapter 39, verse 7. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. We find in the end of chapter 1, 
the spirit records. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Well, of course, that's 536 B.C. Now, actually, Daniel's time there in Babylon was much longer than that. But if you know your Bible, you know that the exile lasted 70 years. And so we find right here that Daniel was amongst the first exiles to go in to Babylon. And though his life was shattered from a worldly perspective by becoming a eunuch, the Bible says that he served the kings of Babylon all the way to the time that King Cyrus came to the throne. What's significant about that? Well, we understand that it was King Cyrus that then, moved by God, sends the exiles back to Babylon. Daniel himself as a prophetic figure signaled that God was watching out for his people, that the life of his prophet spanned even beyond the exile of his people. And of course, the whole book of Daniel, and you know it well, is filled with visions and dreams. For without visions and dreams, God's people perish. And so I want to look at three dreams, three visions today that sustain God's people in this dark, dark hour, and prayerfully will be an inspiration to all of us to sustain us in this dark hour of church history. In chapter 2, we find that Nebuchadnezzar is given a dream, and the Bible says that his mind was troubled and he could not sleep. Let me tell you something. If you're troubled at night, if you cannot sleep, maybe it's God. And the Bible said that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar a dream. Now, it was his custom to tell his dream to his astrologers and to his magicians, and, and he would say, hey, here's my dream. Tell me what it means. But this one was so troubling, and he so desperately wanted the truth that he went to his astrologers, he went to his magicians, he went to his enchanters, and he says, okay, guys, tell me the interpretation of the dream. And they said, we will, O king. What's the dream? He says, I'm not going to tell you. you got to tell me the dream, and then I'll know that your interpretation is true. They said, we, you've never asked that before. He says, listen, if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and nobody guessed the dream. But, of course, God gave it to Daniel. And Daniel comes before Nebuchadnezzar in verse 31, and he says this. You looked, O king. And there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. And now we'll interpret to you, O king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. And in your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise in fear years. Next, the third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything, and the iron breaks things to pieces, and so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw the iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true. And the interpretation is trustworthy. And the church says, yes. the first vision in the book of Daniel is a vision 
for all humanity. Right here, history has revealed the King Nebuchadnezzar. He represented the head of gold, the Babylonian Empire. Next, the Bible says that there was the chest and the arms of silver, representing, of course, the Medo-Persian Empire. Then was the body and the thighs of bronze, representing Alexander the Great or the Grecian Empire. And then, of course, the iron and the clay, representing none other than the Roman Empire. And the Bible says that at that time, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. Well, if it's not by human hands, how can a rock be cut out? It has to be God. So this rock is of God. And the Bible says it strikes this incredible statue. And the statue crumbles and just is totally decimated. The wind comes and blows all of its pieces like chaff away. Except slowly, that little rock becomes a mountain that the Bible says fills the whole earth. And of course, we understand that mountains are synonymous with kingdoms in the Bible. And if the rock was not from human hands, it was from God. And this was, of course, the kingdom. It was the kingdom of God, which is the church. And the Bible, by prophecy, foresees the church as in the first century, filling up the whole earth. From the very beginning, God lays it clear. He wanted the world evangelized in every generation. Amen, guys? You know, it's staggering to think where God's young movement is at in just three years. I mean, already the four major cities of America have cranking discipling churches in New York, L.A., Chicago, and D.C. And, of course, these are augmented by incredible churches in Eugene, Hilo, Honolulu, Las Vegas, Orlando, Phoenix, Portland, and Syracuse. But, you know, th those numbers, more and more are being added. Two weeks ago, it was great to have Bill and Lisa Hamilton with us from Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, they went back. They saw the church that they were baptized into. They went back and started a new sister church, a remnant church in North Carolina. Amen, guys? Then just last night, I got a call from John and Bernie Pareda. Now, Bernie is Therese Antalon's sister, physical sister. They live over in Guam. They've been communicating with the Antalons for a long time. And they just laid it out with their church leadership there. We're tired of lukewarmness. We're tired of the autonomy. We want to be a part of something that changes the world. They called me up and said, bro, there is now a Guam International Christian Church. Does that fire you on up or not? Some ask the question, well, why is there a new movement? Well, God's the one that started it. And it's often out of the ashes that the phoenix rises again. But we need to have a conviction about the darkness that we've come out of, and that'll give us gratefulness for what we have. Abandoned in the early 2000s was the dream itself, the evangelization of the nations in a generation. Our former fellowship, the leaders called it impossible. Some even called it unbiblical. Gone was a sense of oneness where you could travel from city to city and be welcomed by brothers and sisters of like spirit and like commitment, even if you couldn't speak their language. Why? Autonomy had replaced it. Out of the bitterness that came from having to build a movement where the call came to sacrifice people, to sacrifice riches for the sake of building churches in foreign lands. Gone was the call to be sold out disciples. Now, I'm not saying that our former fellowship doesn't have disciples. There are good disciples there. But no longer is it a fellowship of only disciples. 
And if someone's not a disciple, they are not saved. This is concerning. Lukewarmness has been allowed to dwell there. Structure has been obliterated in the name of grace. And yet they've made it a cheap grace where no longer is there accountability in the lives of one another. And so more and more you cannot tell the difference between the world and the quote-unquote church. Gone is the concept of every single person not only needs to be a disciple, but to be discipled and in a discipling relationship. And let's face it, a lot of us wouldn't be faithful to God or to our wives or to one another unless there were brothers and sisters holding us accountable in our lives. Amen, church? We need to understand that it was God that began this new movement. I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, I'm excited about Charlotte. That's awesome. And it's great to have the Chapmans with us today from Charlotte. Amen. I mean, I, I am so excited about Guam. I mean, they don't even know how many people are going to be joining them. 15, 20, 30 people. It's going to be an awesome situation. But today, I'm so excited about the church planting going down to San Diego. Is that going to be awesome, church? You know, when our former fellowship embraced autonomy, not only did it produce autonomous churches, but these churches then began to divide. Yep. Places like London became six churches. Atlanta, ten churches. Here in L.A., there are six churches from our former fellowship. It's there. It just began to splinter. Why? Everyone wants to lead their own kingdom. You know, I can't recommend it publicly. But I can say privately that I really enjoyed this new movie, Avatar. Now, mind you, I'm not going to say anything publicly that would encourage anybody to go see it. Because there are certain things that, that might cause some to stumble. But in it, it was, it was a very powerful thing. When these people came from, I won't wreck the movie for you, but they came to this, this, this new world called Pandora. Of course, Pandora will get you into trouble every time, right? And they come upon these people called the Navi. Now, of course, that's an interesting name for these people because in the Hebrew, Navi means prophet. All these people were prophets. They were of the Spirit. And the most spiritual place they would gather would be around the Tree of Souls. And they just, just mosey in there one by one. They came before the Tree of Souls in unison, in oneness. And they expressed it by physically touching one another. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's have an Avalar moment right here. <laughs> you know, I've got to say something right here. There are some that mock us with the, the song, We Love You with the Love of the Lord. And the fact that we get arm in arm at the end of our services, let me tell you something. There is a power in touching one another. And you know something? I was glad that you guys hugged some of the brothers and sisters here from New York and from Eugene and from Portland because they too are part of the same church. You see, there's, 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 there's a power. In, the, 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 the touching does not stop with just one little city. The touching of one disciple with another disciple must go from city to city, state to state, and nation to nation until the world sees God's true church unified. There was one mountain that filled the earth in that generation, and there needs to be one mountain that fills the earth in this generation. That was the vision for humanity. We need to go on to chapter 10. This next vision 
is most ironic. It's the vision of invisibility. I said, I'll hold it, bro. Hey, how can you have a vision when it's invisible? Well, we're going to read the text, so let's see what happens. Chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. Okay, so the vision we're going to get here involves a great war. The understanding of this message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat, or, or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. He, he went on a fast. And I just want to say here, when's the last time you fasted? No. To seek the will of God. The Bible doesn't say if you fast, but when you fast. And if you've not yet fasted for the sake of this year, then you need to begin that fast with preparation this week. The fast doesn't necessarily have to be food. One of the main fasts of the Old Testament and the one that is alluded to in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, is the fasting from sex. It's the only time that a husband and a wife are allowed not to come together. I mean, yesterday was awesome when Sasha yeah. taught our class, the men, the married men, <laughs> about excellence and romance. Yeah. And he laid it out with the brothers. Yeah. No friendship, no sex. <laughs> and I appreciated that message from Russia with love. Amen? You know what I'm talking about right there? And so you choose what you decide to fast from, but you honor God by abstaining from something you desire. So that in that desire, you can focus on your God and the vision and dream that he'll bestow on you when you fast to seek understanding. Because here's what happens, verse 7. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me didn't see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. And I love that one. Remember Paul, I mean, he's the only one that saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. <laughs> He's the only one. See, this was an invisible vision. But these guys, they must have heard the sound. They just totally freaked out. They didn't see anything. They hear this sound, and they were, they were just overwhelmed with terror, and they fled. These are grown men, and then they go and hide themselves. This is intense. Come on, bro. So I was left alone. Gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My faith turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking. As I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep. My face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up. For I have now been sent to you. And when he had said this to me, I stood up trembling. Now, some may say, well, is, is this Jesus? No, 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 this is not Jesus. This most likely is the archangel Gabriel. Because he's been sent. Angels are messengers of God. He's been sent. Verse 12. Then he continued. Do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. You see, when we fast and when we pray, our God hears. And the Bible says right here that when God heard, he sent the angel in response to that prayer to be able to give Daniel understanding. Verse 13. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Because I was detained there with the king of Persia. 
Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. Right here is one of the great visions that is needed to sustain every disciple. It's the understanding that even when we seek the Lord with prayer and fasting, yes, our God will hear our prayer. And our God will respond. But because of the great war, because of the prince of Persia and the king of Persia, Satan himself, there's such an intense spiritual war that sometime the angel in battle with evil angels and trying to respond to your prayer is delayed. Have you ever wondered why your prayers are not answered? It's not that they're not answered. They're just delayed. Why? Because there's such mighty prayers that there's an angelic battle over the fulfillment of those prayers. Is that intense or not? You know, a brother and sister I, I love with all my heart is Michael Michelle Williamson. And you could say they're as different as black and white. But you put them together, and you have one of the most creative couples around. And I, I, just, can't, I just can't wait to see what God's going to do with that mission team. Come on. Come this, I mean, isn't August going to be awesome with the Jubilee? I mean, when the mission team is sent out, and prayerfully, the entire remnant group from London is going to come join us. Wow. I mean, the, the London church is going to start off at 45, 50 disciples. And then there is going to be an explosion. But you know, the, 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 that, 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 that mixture of, that, that, that gives creativity was, was, was so evident at our New Year's Eve party. And I heard awesome things about each of the region's New Year's Eve party. And certainly we had an incredible time in, in the West. But in the north, Michael and Michelle had to make do with my phone call that said, no, brother, there is no money for your party. Shh. And so I said, well, we have, we have no money for the New Year's Eve party. And so they had to be creative. In their creativity and even in their pain over the past Actually, several days and, and weeks. Pain over their families. It's been four years since Michelle's seen her family in Australia. There's pain in, in Michael's family, just all, all, all the extended family. And, of course, Christmas is that time when we yearn for family that's close. And so many people are in pain. And so it's out of this Pain out of these tears that gave birth to an idea. Early on in the evening, each of the disciples in the North Region were asked to write down not just a, a goal, but an impossible prayer dream. They wrote it down. I mean, do you have one of those? I mean, just the impossible. Often it's that which causes you the deepest pain and anguish. <laughs> then, as the clock neared midnight, and a new year, yay? Yeah. A new decade came to pass. They tied their impossible prayer goals onto white helium-filled balloons. 
And as the clock struck 12, and the world celebrated, they went outside collectively and released their balloons and their prayer goals and impossible prayer dreams up to God. At first they were all together, but soon they were out of sight. One might say they were invisible. But in the midst of this invisibility, our God has heard. Now what hurts the faith of many a disciple, particularly at those darkest hours, during exile, when there is hopelessness, is the fact that God does not answer immediately. And, and our, our conclusion is, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care. We become bitter, destroying the very hope itself that the prayer was sent up to heaven with. But you see, impossible prayers are hard to answer. You know why? Because they're impossible. And you need to understand, it's not that God's up there in heaven just snapping his finger, oh, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it's a battle. It's a real battle. He said, why didn't he just do away with all the evil angels? Well, when he does away with all evil, there the whole earth is judged and entire judgment comes. And most of us want a little bit more time to work here down on the earth. Amen, guys? So evil must exist. Satan must be loosed a while longer. The reality of the spiritual world mystifies most of us that are humanistic American, quote, Christians. The spiritual man. The man who seeks to understand. The man who fasts. The man who does these things and knows by faith that God hears, then the vision of invisibility will come. Now, you'll frighten a lot of other people. But understand, when you pray an impossible prayer, it takes God moving his angels and destiny itself For these to become a reality. You know, when, he, when they shared that with us the other day, I, I thought to myself, I have, I have six impossible prayers. And I went away sad. Let's go to our last vision. The vision of eternal family. In Daniel chapter 12. Monday. At that time, Michael, of course, that's the archangel. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some in everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The vision of eternal family. This is the last vision that was given to Daniel, and the vision that would sustain God's people in a time of darkness, because we know that without vision, the people perish. Here indeed we find that there will be a time 
of judgment. But there's a couple misconceptions that are cleared up in the scripture. First of all, when you die, you just don't pop into heaven. Now, it'll seem like that. See, when you die, the Bible says you fall into a sleep. And this is a cranking sleep. No dreams, no nothing. And so, when you die, you go boom, boom. And then you go, wow, that was incredible. <laughs> Bro, you've been asleep for 300 years. Oh, it's just like that. It's heaven. See, that's why you don't go, oh, no, it's just better for me to go on to heaven now. No, no, no. You're going to sleep in the ground for a while. Do die around for a few hundred years until judgment comes. So don't get these false senses. I just want to go to heaven right now. Amen. We all want to go to heaven. Let me run that back again. We all want to go to heaven. But even Christians can have a pseudo-suicidal thing. I just want to go to heaven now. And, and you think, well, I'll die and go to heaven. No, 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 no. You die and become dust. Dirt. That, that's all that happens. And you sit there. I should say lie there. With the other dusts. And, and you don't know nothing's happening. You're not working because you're just dust. And everybody you know is going to hell because you're not there to share your faith with them. And so your pseudo-suicidal thing causes salvation to be lost. Now, there's another false misconception that's cleared up here. The Bible says there's a heaven and there is a hell. It says it. At judgment, the multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Doesn't sound like more than two options to me there. Like no purgatory? That's a false doctrine. Thank you, bro. So this, this clears up another thing where I even hear Christians go, well... My Aunt Bessie, she had cancer and she was in so much pain, but she died. Oh, she's in peace. No, she, she's in dust waiting for health. Talk about it, bro. We have such a worldly humanistic thing going on. Death, death is meant to stagger us. Us, to terrorize us. Corazano Aquino died this year. Someone just said, Who? She was the leader of the People's Revolution in the Philippines that tried to undo so much evil and corruption. But as great as she was, for many here in this audience, it's who? Walter Cronkite, CBS News, the voice of America, died. Vera Fawcett, whose bathing suit poster Hangs in the Smithsonian. She was so iconic. Died. Ingemar Johansson. He's an athlete. I, I, was, I was just going to my list with Michael Williams the other day. He goes, who is that? I go, get out of Dodge Brawl. You don't, you don't know him. Dude, this was the heavyweight champion of the world. You check it out. When he was heavyweight champion of the world, he was the most famous athlete in the world. But it's who? Come on, bro. Lay it out. Ted Kennedy died. Mary Travers died of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Singing the iconic song, 
blowing in the wind. And puff the magic dragon. <laughs> John Updike, one of the great American authors, died. Probably haven't heard of him, DJ. I don't know about you, when I saw 32-year-old Brittany Murphy died. And then 50-year-old Michael Jackson, the king of pop, died. But in time, it'll be who? Who? You see, the way we live our lives will determine where we spend eternity. And that's meant to scare you into being a disciple. If you're not a disciple, you should be scared. You should be frightened. You should be terrorized. Because death Dust and hell await you because you refuse to honor God. No more of this thing. Oh, may she rest in peace when their lives were heathen and far from God. You know, it is interesting. Those that will inherit eternal life. Verse 3. Those who are wise. Well, they're going to inherit eternal life. Who shine like the brightness of the heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness, soul winners, like the stars forever and ever. Well, Daniel wanted to know what about him? The last verse of the whole book, verse 13. As for you, go on your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. That message is for all faithful disciples. It's just that challenge to the end. To the end. You know, TJ gave us a tremendous vision of what it's going to be like when the world's evangelized. But you know, that's going to pale when we get up to heaven. Because then we see our brothers and sisters of faith from the Old and the New Testament times and in the times after. And there we'll behold the very throne of God and God himself upon it. And you know, at that time, prayerfully, many of us will be able to realize our impossible prayers. Turn to our last scripture, 1 Thessalonians. Paul says to Thessalonian church in verse 19, chapter 2, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we'll glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. You know, when I get up to heaven, I surely want the Lord to say to me, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's household. Why? Because you've been wise and you've won souls. And when I get to heaven, it's, it's going to be awesome to be able to get there and to be able to see that many of the prayers that I prayed are answered. I mean, my hope, Chris Broom. He is my hope. And he, he's not coming up alone on that cloud. He's a wise man who's going to bring a lot of people from Chicago and the Midwest and wherever the Lord takes them in the years to come. Of course, we heard earlier that DJ beat me to heaven. You know, he died when he was 30, and I was surprised when I got up there that he was totally bald at that time. The staggering thing, the boldness didn't take me back. It was the fact he'd put on a hundred pounds there in China. It was, I mean, I could not imagine a fat DJ waddling around in heaven bald. But you know, he wasn't there alone. He had all of these people from New York City 
with him. And all of these people from China with him. See, DJ is my joy. And then there's my crown. My dear wife. Now we won't be married in heaven. That's another false misconception many have. Oh, we'll die and we'll be married happily. No, you won't. Give it up. You either take Sasha's advice here on earth or it's not going to happen. My glory, it's my unanswered prayer. Every day, I pray for my lost daughter, for her husband, for my son, John, and for Eric. I pray for my 81-year-old mom and dad. And from a human point of view, you go, well, how are they going to come around? And it, 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 it often steals my faith. Come on, bro. Come on. And yet I, I have a conviction that this is going to be a battle in heaven. But I've decided to believe. Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. I've decided to believe that they're going to make it. I've decided to believe that I will do everything I can by living the life and saying what needs to be said, no matter what the short-term consequences are. Because I believe that death dust away us all. Then judgment and only heaven or hell. But the vision of eternal family is the one that we will see forever. And I, I want to be there with Chris and DJ and Elena and all the rest. I want us to be able to be arm in arm up there and nobody mock me anymore. <laughs> And then in unison, as we gather all the clouds together, because there'll be no separate clouds. There's no autonomy in heaven. We'll come before the throne, and we will say in unison, we were faithful to the end.